Okay, so let's look at our model of player pay. What we've seen, something that kind of looks like this, right, where we've got pay doing this. And we've got our marginal revenue for our large team. We've got the marginal revenue for our small team. And we've said there's some amount of winning, say W star. <coughs> And what that means is that there's some price P star for talent, right? So remember, we know here that this is WS equals zero, WL equals one. Over here, we've got WS equals one, WL equals zero. <coughs> the question is, is that this is some number, whatever this number is, right? And you kind of have to think of it like this. There's some alternative pay that athletes can do. So if they're not playing football, what else would they be doing? They would be doing something, whatever that something else is, right? Some other job. There's some alternative. And as long as, in the player's mind, they should be getting P star, but as long as the pay right, so the wage should be P star, but as long as the wage is greater than this alternative, what are they going to do? They're going to play, right? Is that obvious? If they're not playing, the alternative is the, what they're going to be doing is they're going to be getting the green amount, green alternative, whatever it is, a, a job in the business world. They're an accountant, right? They went to school. They got a degree in accounting. Now they're playing football. So if they're not playing football, they'll be an accountant. Accountants make whatever, $200,000 a year. As long as football is paying more than $200,000 a year, so Terrace Paris keeping everything else constant, I'm going to play football. P star might be two million. But if I'm getting paid five hundred thousand, my alternative is two hundred thousand as an accountant, I'm going to take the five hundred thousand. So the team owners have an incentive for obvious reasons to try to depress wages. to as close to alternative as they can get, right? I mean, why pay P star when you can pay some amount less than P star, but that's greater than the alternative? And of course, they'd, they'd pay even less than that if they could. So the question is, what are the things that they've done to help kind of reduce wages? And we're going to look at two of them today. First one's the draft. So we know what the purpose of the draft is, right? We've got this reverse order draft. And the idea is that the worst team goes first, the best team goes last, right? And the idea is somehow to ensure that talent gets put in different places. You don't have all the talent being bought up by the same uh, team. But actually, in reality, the draft's goal is to basically reduce competition for the player from 32 teams to one team. And if there's a reduction in the demand, what happens to price? Price goes down, right? If you have one person competing, there's only one person, or there's 32 teams, the price is going to be lower, right? So before the draft, teams would scout the country for talent.
And this, of course, is both time consuming and expensive. Right? So you have this essentially increase in costs of just recruitment. Right? Uh, you've got competition between team owners. players. This of course is going to increase the price paid for the player, which of course is going to increase costs. So you have a system here where I have to go out and look for the talent. And I'm sure you guys have all seen the movies like uh, The Natural and all that kind of stuff. The guy's on the train, he's going, he, he's a talent scout, he's going around doing stuff. Today, it's a whole lot easier, right? Players make their videos and send them in, right? The NFL doesn't have to do anything. They can sit there and watch video all day long. Decrease in cost, decrease in competition for players, right? So before the draft, we have not only the players more expensive, but the cost to actually get the player is more expensive. So for example here, you've got the Chicago Bears, Sign Red Grange. In 1925, before he's done with college. <coughs> You've got a bidding war between the Brooklyn Dodgers. And the Philadelphia Eagles for Stan Kustis. This is 1935. Okay. This bidding war between these two teams, the Brooklyn Dodgers and the Philadelphia Eagles. Of course, this is baseball. It means that this guy was getting paid $5,000, or uh, $5,000. I'm sorry, this is football. So the NFL responds to this by having a reverse order draft. Right. The idea being that now we're going to reduce the competition for players. Right? There's only one team competing for your services. So we see this reduction here. We see this reduction in the pay for these uh, rookies. This is lowers, not lovers. Right? And remember, the athletes are all paid relative to each other. If the rookies are getting paid less, that means the stars can be paid less. Because it's relatively speaking to the stars. We also see this reduction in transactions cost for recruiting. Right? They come to us now. We don't have to go to them. They're the ones that spend time and energy trying to say, pick me, pick me, pick me. So we see reduced transactions cost and we see lower pay for rookies. Of course, lower pay for rookies means that we can pay stars relatively less as well. Because once again, it's all relatively speaking. So owners, of course, claim that the draft helps weaker teams compete. But as we're going to see when we look at the invariance principle, that's not really true. Basically, it's a way to reduce player pay. 
And of course, this has been very, very successful in the NFL. It was adopted in the other leagues as well, NBA, NHL, uh, MLB. All right? I mean, if you think about it, as long as you're over the age of 18 and can sign a contract, who's to say you can't hire somebody? Football, basketball, anything. Why should any of that stuff even matter, right? The whole reason that you have to, in essence, go to college to be in the NFL is it, it, it's the players getting, it's the owners getting together and trying to control who can come in and who cannot. Right? It's a way of essentially trying to reduce player pay. Let's look at the other alternative. The other alternative is the reserve clause. And what this does is this seeks to lower competition after they're in the league. So we want to reduce competition before they even get in. That's the draft. Once they're in, how do we keep other teams from bidding them away? Well, we're going to use the reserve clause. So let's look at the history of this in baseball. It's kind of interesting. 1876, you got the National League. No rules for the competition of talent. So the result for this is going to be what? Yeah, and how are they going to do that? More money, right? So the result here is high wages, especially for the good players. Once again, the players are all paid relative to each other. So we have high wages for the good players, which means by definition even the weaker players are getting more money. Once again, they're all paid relative to each other. All right. 1879. They form a list of five players. That every team holds off the market. And player contracts state that they have to live with the uh, league's constitution and bylaws. starts becoming very successful, right? Basically, the teams get together and say, here's my list of five players. We all agree not to bid for this list of five players. They expand that in 1889 to the reserve clause. Bless you. And let's see what the reserve clause says. It is further understood and agreed to that the party, the first part, the team, shall have the right to reserve the said party of the second part, that's the player, for the season next ensuing. 
subject to the condition that the said party of the second part shall not be reserved at a salary less than that paid in the present season. All right? In other words, what the reserve clause says is that we have the right to retain you on the condition that we don't pay you less this season than we paid you last season. Okay? And then it goes on a little bit further and says, if prior to March 1st, the player and the club have not agreed upon the terms of the contract for the next playing season, then on or before 10 days after March 1st, the club shall have the right to renew this contract for the period of one year of the same terms, except that the amount payable to the player shall be such as the club shall fix and said notice. In other words, if the player says, you know what, I don't think this is a good deal, I want more money. And they have negotiations back and forth and they can't agree to anything. Basically what this says on March 1st, all the negotiations stop. Ten days later, the team basically says, all right, we're just going to pay you what we paid you before. If you don't like it, tough. You're, you're out of here. And because you're on our roster, nobody else is going to be able to bid for you anyway. So this reserve clause allows the teams... to retain players under identical conditions forever. Players only recourse is to not play. You have the Sherman Antitrust Act. What's the Sherman Antitrust Act basically say? You can't have trust. People can't get together as firms and set prices. You can't collude. Now, interestingly enough, that also applied to unions. That's exactly what a union is. Workers getting together and saying, we're going to set the price. The price you must pay us is X, right? So just like the Sherman Antitrust Act was used to break up big business, it was also used initially to break up unions. So they actually had to go in and insert language in there that said, hey, it's okay to be a union, right? But in essence, unions are in violation of the Sherman Antitrust Act. So let's see what the Sherman Antitrust Act basically says. Every contract, combination in the form of trust or otherwise, or conspiracy and restraint of trade or commerce among the several states or with foreign nations is declared to be illegal. Right? You can't have a trust that's within the country between states. Uh, every person shall monopolize or attempt to monopolize or combine or conspire with any other person or persons to monopolize any part of trade or commerce among the states or with foreign nations shall be deemed guilty of a felony. Right? So basically it says if you're a firm, interestingly enough, it is not illegal to collude if you only stay within the state of Missouri, according to the Sherman and the Trust Act of 1890. Right? So we're going to get together, we're going to not compete for these particular players. Sherman Antitrust Act 1890. 1914, 1915, we have the Federal League.
This is a rival league. Okay. They sue the National Commission. which oversees the American League and the National League. And they sue them under the Sherman Antitrust Act. It's a rival league. We've already seen what happens with rival leagues, right? They want to keep rival leagues out. So here's a league that's starting to form. They can't get in. They're saying, we're going to sue you. The exact same thing that President Trump, who used to be a team owner in the USFL, did to the NFL. He said, NFL, you guys are colluding. You're in violation of the Sherman Antitrust Act. You're colluding to keep out other rival leagues that want to provide football in a different way. Case goes to Judge Kennesaw. Mountain Landis. All right. This guy is a future commissioner of baseball. He's known as a trust buster. Right? He's a federal judge. But in this case, he also really, really, really likes baseball. I mean, he's a future commissioner of baseball. The guy likes baseball. He refuses to issue a ruling. for over a year. During this time frame, the leagues, the American League and the National League, are getting together. They are buying out teams in the Federal League. So you have these teams there, all right? 10 teams, 20 teams, whatever the number is. It could be any number that you want it to be. You've got these teams there. They're suing baseball, Major League Baseball. Major League Baseball says, well, during this time frame, why don't we start <coughs> buying people out? We're going to buy you out. Why don't you bring your team over into our league? Leave the Federal League and come over to ours. Okay, that sounds like a pretty good deal. Come on over to us. Come on over to us. Come on over to us. All right? Ned Hanlon here, he's the owner of the Baltimore Terrapins. All right? He's offered a buyout of $50,000, which is significantly less than the other owners got. And one of the reasons that it's significantly less than the amount the other owners got is because he's one of the last people. So if everyone else has left the federal league and there's only two or three teams left, how are they going to have a league? You're not. So who's he going to play? He's not going to play anybody. Buying him out, it doesn't cost them that much. Right? 
So they say, we're going to pay you $50,000 when they bought these other teams out for much larger amounts of money. And the reason they bought those larger teams out is they needed to get enough teams out of the league to make the league become less valuable. Well, how do you think he responds to this? Uh, not positively. He's like, this sucks. I'm only getting fifty thousand dollars, and these other people over here got three hundred, and this guy got four fifty, and this guy got one twenty-five. So he himself sues. Files his own antitrust lawsuit. Federal Baseball Club of Baltimore versus the National League of Professional Baseball. Wins his case wins $80,000 in damages, okay. and during this time in 1914, you had the Clayton Act, which strengthened the Sherman Antitrust Act <clears throat> and kind of laid down some of the groundwork for damages. Right? So these damages are tripled. So he's sitting pretty on a cool quarter million. Donald Trump won his lawsuit. He was awarded damages of $1, which the court tripled to $3. He has not cashed the check. It is sitting there collecting interest. It's up to like $3 and or four or five bucks now, I think. You can find it online to see how much it's actually worth now. The National League of Professional Baseball says, this sucks. We don't want this. So they appeal to the Supreme Court. SCOTUS, right? Supreme Court of the United States. Here we see the decision overturned. And in essence, what the Chief Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes says is that baseball is public exhibition. Not commerce. Since there's no commerce, it's not subject to federal oversight, right? Remember, you've got the Commerce Clause here. And that it's in the Constitution, right? And that regulates commerce between the states. It does not regulate commerce within the state. That's the state's jurisdiction. All that the Commerce Clause says is that here are the rules for commerce that occurs between states. Within the state, you can do whatever you want to do. And he says, this is a public exhibition, it's not commerce. There's no interstate commerce that's occurring, despite the fact that team here in Pennsylvania is traveling down here to Maryland. They're charging, they're paying people money, people are paying them money, 
this team here in New York travels all the way over here to Illinois, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. He says it's not subject to any of these rules. And so what you have here is you've got Major League Baseball acquires a uh, antitrust exemption. So that antitrust exemption means the baseball can do what? They can do whatever they want to do. They want to get together and collude and set prices, they can get together and collude and set prices. They want to get together and make all of the players do 10 jumping jacks on the middle of the field, they can get that, they can do that. They can do whatever it is that they want to do. Now, for obvious reasons, that's pretty valuable for the owners. That's like Missouri State, the University of Missouri, Missouri Southern, Northeast or Truman State, Northwest Missouri State, Southeast Missouri State, all getting together and say, here's the tuition we're going to charge. We're all going to charge a price of $500 a credit hour. So, for obvious reasons, the other leagues want in. 1950s. George Radovich. Brings an antitrust lawsuit. against the NFL. The reason is, is that he was blacklisted from playing for playing in the AA FC, the All-American Football Conference. Does that sound familiar? Isn't somebody else suing the NFL owners right now, saying I've been blacklisted? See, this stuff never changes, does it? Laura Court dismisses. And they dismiss it based upon the federal baseball case. Well, if it's true for baseball, it must be true for football. It's the same thing, you're just playing a different sport. He appeals. This goes all the way to SCOTUS. In 1957, and SCOTUS rules with Radovich. SCOTUS says the federal baseball case only applies to baseball. They also say, we don't like the case. We don't like the results. But it only applies to baseball. They don't like overturning themselves. Pete Rozelle petitions Congress. for a limited exemption.
from antitrust for football, basketball, and hockey. And what they say is that we want this to apply only to league-wide negotiations for broadcasting. Basically, we don't want the stuff that baseball has. Just give us the ability to get together and collude when we deal with broadcasting. Congress says, okay, that sounds fine. 1962, Congress says yes. Football, basketball, and hockey all get together. If you want to show NFL games, you don't deal with the Dallas Cowboys or the Kansas City Chiefs. You deal with the NFL. They all come together. It's one big giant block. Right. So for obvious reasons, you see broadcasting revenue increase significantly. Uh, the New York Giants see a five-fold increase. Green Bay Packers see a 13-fold increase in revenues. How could you lose money? Let the camel's nose into the tent. What happens next? The whole camel comes in, right? So he says, well, this works pretty good for broadcasting rights. So let's expand this a bit. So Pete Rozelle here, he's commissioner of the NFL. He uses the Rozelle rule. to limit competition for players. In 1972, you got a guy by the name of John Mackey. He's president of the union, the players' union, he files suit. U.S. District Court says the Roselle rule is a per se violation of Sherman Antitrust Act. The appeals court rules in favor of Mackey. Now we can go to SCOTUS and have SCOTUS rule that it's a violation or we can let it go, right? So in essence, what they do is that they say, well, we're going to let this go. We're going to settle the suit. We're going to settle the suit with Mackey. All right? Because if we go to SCOTUS and they rule against us, what might they also take away? Not only might they overturn the Roselle rule that limits competition for players, but they might also do what? They also might take away the broadcasting. We want to keep our broadcasting. That's increased revenues by tremendous amounts of money. So forget it. It's not worth going in to deal with. Settle the suit before we lose all the other good stuff. All right. Interestingly enough, uh, Mackey here in 1970 was voted best tight end in the league. Uh, 
Um, but he's denied entrance to the NFL Hall of Fame till 1992. That's when he makes it into the Hall of Fame. They make sure that they stack the cards definitely against him, right? 20 years after the guy's retired is when he makes it into the NFL Hall of Fame. So we're able to use federal baseball to some degree to get some of what we wanted in the NFL, hockey, and basketball. But hey, we didn't want to push our luck. What we'll see on Monday is what happens here in baseball as we move forward with this because we're not quite done with this reserve clause stuff.